our fire alarm light stopped blinking. So why don't we try to take our seats again and press ahead, realizing the guy will probably come back on, up on the speaker to tell us that we're all clear. But let's, let's see if we can press ahead a bit. So frankly, I forget who was speaking. Was it Dan? Well, I started to say something about NIST and uh, <laughs> common mode failure. Uh, their, definition, their definition of common mode failure, which of course is ironic here, uh, their definition of common mode failure is <laughs> software that fails under identical conditions. In other words, it's not redundant. It is in, instead common, has a common failure uh, setting. And that's Sorry, Dan. No, it's, it's fine. It's oh, just, okay. yeah. you're, you're dumbing, this was in response to your yeah. potential or somebody's potential dumbing down idea. Um, avoiding common mode failure, I think the best way to do that, the cheapest way to do it, back to margin, is to retain some of the stuff that currently works. Not to retire everything, mm -hmm. but to retain some of the stuff that, that's, that still mm -hmm. works so that it is at least available. I will say that in computer settings, I've frequently seen people who have spare capacity, but they, um, what's a good example? Uh, CNN, CNN Atlanta. Um, they own the Cartoon Network. Why do they own it? They bought it after 9-11. Why? Because they discovered that if everybody hits CNN.com return, their machinery died. And so they bought the Cartoon Network, literally, so that, um, in the event of a situation where their machinery is being drowned by requests, they can repurpose the cartoon, cartoon network for CNN.com on the fly. Now, there's an example of a resiliency strategy. They also, by the way, they have a whole stair step of things. Well, if, if the load is at this level, we only have one story on the page. If the load reach above, goes above this level, we don't have any pictures. If it goes above this level, we have plain text only, no, uh, no font formatting. You get the idea. But they have, a, they have a stair step for this, and it's all about what to do when demand exceeds supply to the point of it would crash CNN. I mean, I suspect there are little examples of industries in various places that have thought through their version of this problem quite well. It probably wouldn't hurt to steal whatever they do, because why, re why reinvent something? Well, I, I would say that, um, to answer your question, the airport Airports as a whole have achieved the dumbing down strategy. Um, I think we're there. <laughs> and quite frankly, what we really need to do is, you know, if you look at what the essence of an airport is, it's just a big parking lot for passengers, for airplanes. It's a shopping center. And those industries are working, you know, they're moving very quickly. And uh, the airport uh, really does need to keep in step with how quickly those industries are moving. So. No, I don't think we need to slow down. I, I think we are in desperate need of speeding up. Peter? Yeah, I think in response to Dan, um, one, one of the challenges I think in our industry is that we have these huge innovation pushes, um, namely new generation of, of aircraft. Once the generation is there, um, once the aircraft is there, it's, it's managed very professionally. Mm -hmm. with then you have, let's say, 10 years, you have a kind of standstill, but then you have the huge power of innovation and all that has been developed and thought through about cyber is put into a new generation like the 787, I could say the A350, you would disagree, but the, <laughs> let's say that's... That's, the, um, that's the, for the, the dumbing down discussion. The, um, <laughs> the 787. And the second challenge, the second challenge we are facing is um, the... The, 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 that process of innovation is fragmented. So the engineering and um, innovating this, pro this, this progress innovation is with the manufacturers. No, airport or no, no airline operator is sure that he would even buy these, uh, the, these aircraft I, I'm going to on. interrupt you and ask you, does Lufthansa do the boarding pass on the cell phone, and how did you decide to do that? That, but that is not mission critical in terms of that, 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 might, that might bring our operation down for a day or two. 
But we still have lists. Okay. We can keep lists, and every and at every gate we have lists to 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 to, to mark by hand, and every check-in agent is mm -hmm. is is mm -hmm. trained to 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 have a manual process in place. Okay. Not electronic. The, 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 the issue is the the core process of inno, of an innovated aircraft, and keeping that in operation with all the features and the influences of different people being part of that innovation. Mm -hmm. That, that, okay. that is fragmented. We are operating it. Somebody else is inventing. Uh, it's venting. I mean, CNN <laughs> isn't building the computers. They are, mm -hmm. they, are, they are using it either. But I think we have these pushes and we have the fragmentation, and that makes it more complex than maybe sure. in, in other industries where you can, I agree with you, an incremental strategy <coughs> of carefully adapting step by step is probably something that would generate a lot of security. It is difficult in our industry, in my perception. Other? Yeah, you know, um, <coughs> there, there is a, I think of latency and common modes and dumbing down kind of in the, they're all related. Um, it was mentioned earlier the, that you don't want a latent fault that isn't, um, you assume there can be a fault and then you um, make that fault known. And so that's an important concept for us. And, and if we have latent faults in the system, we assume that they've already happened. We, we, just, we already assume in our safety analysis that the, latent, the probability of that latent fault is one, and then we have to design around it. Um, we treat common modes as a single fault. So if you have three flight control computers and they're all, they all have exactly the same code in them and they're getting um, not the same input but the same types of inputs from three different airspeed systems, let's say, um, we treat that common mode failure as one failure. Mm -hmm. So if it happens, it, it's going to happen to all three. We assume that going in. But the dumbing down thing is really interesting because we, we think about that a lot. Um, not just turning off the autopilot because any pilot can do that, but for our airplanes that have critical fly-by-wire flight control systems, um, we allow the flight crew to just turn it off. And so we go into a backup hardware mode that's fully analyzable and fully testable. Mm -hmm. Software's out of the loop. and mm -hmm. so. If, if something happens, and we do it not so much because of security, but this is where security and safety um, aren't the same, but they're, they're complementary in some cases. Um, we do it because of the integrity of the code. Um, we assume that no matter what we do, the code's going to do something that we hadn't expected someday, and we want the pilot to be able to set that aside and go with a, a, mm -hmm. a analog, essentially, mm -hmm. system. Now, it doesn't have as much capability. The ride quality won't be as good. Um, you know, you may not be able um, to turn on the autopilot, let's say, and do a Cat 3 landing with, a, with this backup system, but nonetheless, it's there in the case of mm -hmm. dumbing down. Mm -hmm. And that's not, we haven't, we haven't used that term internally before, but, but it is a graceful degradation of capability that takes you into a more known and knowable state. Well, that's a great term. I, I use that instead, graceful degradation. That's... You know, for, for those of you who don't follow it, you may or not know, may not know what Bitcoin is. It's a digital currency of sorts. Um, it's open source. The people who check it in, uh, you can't check it in unless three different people have compiled it and got identical binary. It's a kind of strategy for protecting an open source code pool mm -hmm. is that it builds the same for multiple people. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, and, yeah. and now you're talking about something that has no financial backing. There's, not any, there's mm -hmm. no one being paid to do this, but that's... That's what they do. So I mean, I'm going to go to the audience uh, next. But, uh, a question, another question on, on the uh, framework document. So especially for the, the, the aviation constituencies, um, same industry, but different profit margins, perhaps some different motivations, different levels of organization. Can you work together on a unified framework? Absolutely. At what speed can you work? How quickly does this need to happen? It's a good question. Open for everybody. Dominic, you talked about you know, the, the state of airports, and this really isn't necessarily a large issue for, for the airports. Now you're, you're just ramping up. but. Yeah. How, do, how do we bring these pieces together? Uh, any, any thoughts or thinking AIAA has done you know, something important here is do we need other 
other mechanisms to help push this forward? Are there other organizations that really need to be involved? Uh, and are we leaving someone out uh, if we're going to pull together a unified approach? It, comments on that? Well, I'm going to go back to something Peter said. My hope is that the airports, both uh, domestically and internationally, do this on their own before TSA or other government entities step in because I think that will uh, put us in a situation that uh, we don't want to be in. And, and, you know, I mentioned in the introduction that I had, you know, was a CIO in the federal government for the National Park Service. We had, uh, we had to certify and accredit every one of our systems. They became paper exercises rather than security exercises. I, I felt that I spent far more money on documentation than I did on actual security. So, you know, I think the framework, that's what I'm excited about the framework in, in bringing that back to the airport community to see if we can, you know, on our own push this ball down the field. Otherwise, someone's going to push it onto us. I would just offer that one of the boundary conditions in that timeline, February 2014, is when the NIST-generated cybersecurity framework will be approved. I think it would be prudent to have this aviation framework completed by then to be able, able to offer it as a worked example of how the aviation industry is, is, is working there. That, that means tracking with the, the NIST framework also. And we may, we've made reference to what, what's going on with, the, with NIST on, on the framework, but I, it's an interesting timeline. So uh, is, is that a doable timeline? We're sitting here in August. Uh, yeah, February is pretty, pretty soon uh, as, we think, as we think about it. Um, questions, from the, questions from the audience? Barbara. I think, yeah. I, I think that's one, one point that's concern, that concerns me at the moment. We are trying to put the, the knowledge together, but we are not really challenging ourselves in, in, a, mixed, in a mixed composition of knowledge. So we don't have mixed red teams around that would start thinking the bad way. Um, instead, we are dependent on the design of engineers, of manufacturers that intend the good, that want all safety features in included, but I would doubt that the security threat is actively challenged or performed <laughs> or tried out in the development process. And this is one of the things I have in mind where we need to progress, that we really, in confidence, have to sit together with mixed, with mixed competences and say, is it just crazy what I think, or is it is it makeable? Is it is it is it feasible? And the users 
might come up with more crazy ideas than the engineers at the moment have in mind. That is what, what concerns me at the moment. But I never tried it out, and I'm glad I still can sleep on aircraft, too. I can sleep in cars, but I, I sleep in aircraft, too. Uh, I'm feeling safe and secure um, knowing about these efforts of hackers and knowing that they have not been successful and that they have been heavily overstated in the press. Um, but I'm a little bit concerned if we can develop the, the same dynamic as the technical development has and as the, trackers, uh, uh, the, the hackers' uh, activities might have. And we have the first USB interfaces in the cockpit. Other, other comments to uh, uh, Barbara's question? Or, oh, okay. Other, other questions? Sure. Uh, This is, a, this is a very interesting question, and it's a, um, a question of some debate in the industry, frankly. Um, our, our philosophy is the flight crew is the ultimate, has the ultimate authority and control of the airplane. Um, and we assume that the, the training is appropriate. We assume that the operation is per the intended guidelines. We try to provide as much situational awareness an intuitive interaction and interface as we can. And then we assume that with the right training, with the proper interfaces, that the flight crew will do the right thing. We believe that the, um, that the potential for error is greater if we assume that the machine knows more than the pilot. Just somebody mentioned over here um, that they want to have, they believe that there should be a human in the loop. I think it was Dan said there should be a human in the loop. That's very important to us that there's a human in the loop because to the, the engineer at the desk that has the, all the best intentions and has the, a very rigorous test program, at the end of the day, at the end of a very rigorous test program, you may have seen 4,000 hours of flight hours on the airplane prior to its entry into service. You may have seen 6,000 hours of ground test on the airplane itself, maybe 100,000 hours of laboratory testing. And in the first year, you'll have 10 times that with a large fleet. And so, you know, you never know, you can never predict all the potential situations. And so we choose to assume that, um, that the pilots are smarter than the engineers, that they'll make better decisions based on all the inputs that are there for them. We try to provide as much guidance as we can, but at the end of the day, we provide the flight crew with all the capability that the airplane has and trust that they're in a better position to make a decision then and there than we were at the design board four years earlier. And it doesn't always work out perfectly. Our belief is it works out better that way than it would the other way. Over here. Yeah, that, 
Yeah, you know, that, that's absolutely correct. And we, um, we don't write any of the code. No, we write some, but very little. You know, there's 18 million lines of code on the, the 8.7. There's probably six or eight million lines of code on the 777. And the vast majority of that is developed by our partners, people like Rockwell Collins, Honeywell, Hamilton Sunstrand, United Technologies, um, General Electric. The, the way we do it is by following a very rigorous development process um, where the, the threat is commensurate with the risk and the design assurance level is commensurate with the, the risk that would be posed to the airplane. Um, the type of software testing that I described before um, for critical systems applies to anyone who's writing that, that software and it's certified as such. And there are Boeing um, representatives of the FAA who, who are part of that certification process. So while we don't write the code, we are very involved in the, the testing and the certification of the code. And, um, and, and I, to this point anyway, that has served us really, really very well. We have, you know, you get, you get errors in the code. We, us, we um, ensure that those errors can't have a catastrophic outcome at the airplane level. And if we find things in service, we fix them. But it is after a fairly rigorous and robust test program. I think my only point is I want to make sure that in spite of all that, that we're not putting an airplane or a crew in a position where we think we know more than they do at that time, given all the inputs. We give them all the information they can so they're making a good decision. Um, but we don't assume that five years from now, what we know today is better than what he'll know in the cockpit five years from now. It's basically a supply chain question, and I want to yeah, open it. I, I want oh. push this down the supply chain. Absolutely. So, and, I, and I want to broaden it yep. beyond Boeing, yep, yep. because everybody has a supply chain to deal with. It's not just Boeing the manufacturer or Airbus the manufacturer. And any general comments, you know, from you know, Dominic or Peter on, on supply chain issues? Um, I, I, I wanted to strengthen and agree uh, to, to Michael's message. I, my concern is that at the moment we have a kind of supply chain where Boeing is on the top of command for everything that is built in the aircraft. There might be, there, there are a lot of people who are helping in the, in, the, in the supply chain and who are generating a lot of data, who are interested in a lot of data that is generated during flight or during the operation. One of my concerns is who is in command of all the data that is generated and flying around then later on in the operational phase? Will, it, will, will we be able to channel this to the MRO, to the airline, to the um, aircraft manufacturer? How, how, how much will this process of a chain be paralyzed by a lot of people who also want actively manage let's say, online, the data that, that, that is generated. So a supply chain which generates quite some control and good control by the manufacturers might be um, replaced by, by a, a, a system where several players have the intention to, to be more active in the data management. Other, other comments on supply chain? Uh, other questions? Yeah. I was curious uh, how, how a malicious insider, um, someone in the maintenance of an aircraft, or even a pilot, or, you know, how does the framework, or how, how does the aviation uh, domain kind of respond to that, that threat of a malicious insider? wants to jump first. I think he stumped us. <laughs> is, it, is that question in, in the context of the framework only? Or is that a broader question of how the industry deals with that? I think it's a broader question. I mean, are, is that being addressed or is that, even, is that even a threat factor that you're concerned about? Well, it, it, it is addressed. I mean, we are addressing it for the current uh, conventional threats, I could say. I mean, we have had accidents or in, um, terrible incidents uh, that were due to failure of uh, pilots, for example, the Egypt Air uh, uh, incident some, some, some years ago. Um, I don't think you can, you can make it 
secure through technical systems. We, we, have, a, we have a system of background checks, of qualifications. Uh, we're trying to, to, to put thrust, uh, tr trust in our people, and we're trying to get the information we need to keep non-trustable people out of the, of the organization. But you will never be sure that this is, that, that you're capable to do, it, to do this. As it is the same in the, let's say, law enforcement, um, you probably have a lot of people who shoot them, who misuse the weapons they have. Um, but, um, or few, of course, few people, but uh, you, you will never be able to totally eliminate that, that, that uh, effect. I will say that there, you know, just generally speaking, that there's, there's always been a debate of, you know, is it the, the outsider and the insider? And, and over the past 10 years, there's been kind of focus, well, it's more the insider than the outsider. But I think it might, might be focusing on the wrong problem, so to speak, in that it's what are those mitigation controls mm -hmm. that can be put in place that will address both? And, and those, those checks you might have, and what the one set of controls that I would highlight that is pretty interesting out there, it's, it's been around for a couple of years now, is the 20 critical controls that has been put together by SANS and, um, and CSIS. Uh, prioritize controls that they make a very big point in their overview document that it's meant to address both and, and, and so as, as I think about the framework going forward it's we do need to address the insider but uh, if you will not be obsessed by the insider think of the controls that can that can actually apply to both the insider and the outsider and, and a cooperation between the two this this is not specific to aviation but because I mostly have a background in finance since, you know, that's where up till now the money has been. The, um, the, um, if you design, f particularly for data protection, if you design your protection such that you're proof against the insider, you largely solve the outsider attack as a side effect because the outsider's first measure of success is becoming an insider and gaining the access of an insider. So as a design principle, designing against the insider solves the other problem without any extra expenditure, just for what that's worth. Other, other comments on this? Okay. Uh, uh, other questions? We're getting close to wrap up here, okay. <clears throat> Well, I think the framework addresses um, developing standards and, and uh, standard methods of operation that would include things like um, encryption of data streams, segregation and encryption of data streams. So while that may not be um, being done today, I think the framework starts the discussion to, to head in that direction. Mm. I, I was. I also. There, there was a recent conference in, in Amsterdam, a hackers conference, and they built up something where they tried to manipulate ACAS messages, and it was a big fuss. Yeah, the, 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 six hours later, the later, the, the largest German uh, uh, um, newspaper was at my desk and say, "Oh, how secure is is, is flying?" Yeah, and I was relieved to get the information from our flight operations specialist that our ACAS is encrypted. But I was concerned to learn that we are the only airline or one of the very few airlines that is investing in the encryption of the ACAS. And that is not a common procedure. This is why we have brought it, this in, into this paper, because this is one of the uh, things, I, I, I think, the, the first steps which have to be common sense is that probably encryption doesn't, um, might not solve all problems, but it's certainly not harming uh, if, if, we're, if we're doing it, and it makes it a kind of more difficult. So 
for, for, for us, I, I was relieved, and it was a piece of cake to answer, well, we are as a quality airline, you know, yeah, we encrypting our, our messages. But I said, ooh, lucky us, huh? because it could have been different, huh? and that goes back to the 3% margin again. You, you know, it's a lot easier for somebody to go out and buy a handheld VHF radio and just start talking on the air yeah. without any encryption that. whatsoever. The question is how, how much impresses that the average pilot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions? So um, I'm going to ask for wrap up after this, but one one piece I think I should talk about: Do any of you foresee international ob obstacles to pursuing a framework or creating a roadmap? And what prompted my thinking on this was the question of encryption, because there are certain technologies out there that, you know, certainly in the U.S. government, might not want to see exported or a, a, there could be a solution that is not necessarily exportable. And I know this has come up in past uh, conversations. So when, when we think about the solution set, do you foresee um, government, if you're government-driven obstacles, it could be U.S., could be elsewhere? I, I'm, I'm more concerned with the, in, in, that, in that aspect with, with, with a different challenge. If you want to go forward, you're always challenged to include the global community in, in your efforts. And on the other hand, you need leadership to perform. And certainly, the US is much more in the position of giving leadership to this development than countries like South Africa or somebody, somebody else. So you need the leaders to go forward. These leaders also set the standard. My concern is that it is simply, in this case, it's not enough to have a, a, a national in initiative because we have learned this morning cyber is independent of the nation. The cyber threat could be generated somewhere in Northern Korea and applied to a U.S. aircraft flying over Malaysia and what is, what is then? So, so that is, it cannot be solved with just applying national principles. On the other hand, I must say, um, if I want progress on a global level in aviation security, I could go to Montreal and there is ICAO and that is a, an organization and you either have ICAO or you have progress. It takes at least five years to go forward with, with an issue like this that you come to the first conclusion. So we would be lacking off speed. So I see the, I see the real challenge also, also for the US you have to go forward because you're an innovator, you're a leader at the moment, but my appeal is please don't make this a too much national approach because it is evident for the complete global community of yep. aviation. Okay. Other, other thoughts on that? Okay, so in wrapping up, uh, closing comments for, from each of you, but if, if I could ask, uh, in your closing comment, if there was one thing that you would like to see change sooner rather than later in order to make things more secure, what might that be? Uh, what would be on the top of your list of, you know, if you could affect a change? Doesn't necessarily to be within the, uh, uh, your particular constituency as a manufacturer or a carrier, but if there's one thing that is, uh, should be front loaded, what would that be? And who would like anybody? Whoever wants to go first, but you all got to—you all got to comment. Nobody gets out. Uh, I'll go. It's just a short comment. I think um, the sh what I'd like to see is the sharing of information so that we can, so that all the constituents can better understand the threat. And and it's a continued sharing of information as the threat evolves. Well, I I'm going to um, cheat here and say I agree with that in the sense that the. The, if the bullets about understanding the risk and the threat and the design principles are the most important, which I think they are, then this is this is the precondition. So, and so um, when you say sharing the information, can, can you expand that just a little bit? Is that it, among, some might interpret that just as threat data, but it could be much broader. It, it, could, it could very well be much broader. And as a, I have a very limited view of the problem um, because I'm so used to thrown tread and hydraulic leaks. I'm not used to bad actors in third-party states, but I'm going to have to get used. I'm going to have to be 
uh, fluent in that. So um, I think it's I think it's the sharing of threat information among all parties, uh, attack information. Um, information about an attack that has happened and could potentially spread to other constituents in the in the aviation business. So I think it's it's uh, not just information about the type of threat, but about activity as well and consequences. Okay. Eric, well, I, I'll just respond to that by saying that. Um, I, I think that is, is an absolutely uh, imperative goal to have, whether it comes out of the, the framework discussion or follow on implementation efforts. I think part of that has to do with um, really making that view known uh, within the Washington community, uh, because as I in, implied in um, <coughs> my comments on, on the fact that things are stalled on the uh, information sharing part. But the other part is that uh, as I interpreted what you said, that there's also sharing within the members of this own, your own community here, and that does require some sort of governance mechanism or, or, or uh, situational awareness mechanism that I, I guess uh, doesn't exist right now. Uh, so, points yeah. well taken. Yeah. Peter, Dominic, last words? Well, in the airport community, and, and I've touched on it, uh, we have to begin the conversation right now. It's just, it's just started at the technology level, but airport managers, not only in the United States, but around the world, are going to have to become aware that this is a real issue that can affect them. And, uh, and I don't believe that at this point it has still achieved that level. Last word. I have too many. I have to cross something out here. Um, I, I think cooperation has been mentioned, cooperation within the industry. What I would really wish for for the future was more shared responsibility and true openness with government and, and industry. We haven't reached this status in aviation security yet. It's a command and follow regime, but it's not a regime of trust and cooperation. And if we want to design something together, we have to gain more, more, more trust in there. And the more pragmatic things, I think we have to quickly agree for the quick wins that make aviation more secure, also to place it to the outside, maybe more encryption, more joint standards, more visible activities between the different, fact, the different sectors, uh, not only manufacturers, airline, airport, but also ATC and other important parts. Well, I want to uh, thank our panelists, uh, an excellent panel, and thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon and uh, enduring the fire alarm uh, in the middle. Um, the framework uh, document uh, can also be uh, downloaded. It's available through the AIAA um, website. And so if you could spread the word uh, and get the word out and, and be back in contact with uh, AIAA. I guess, Angela, I'm looking at you. I don't know who the right point of contact is on your team for, for any comments that might be coming back in, or you can reach out to Jim Pisaka uh, as well. So thank you uh, very much, and have a good afternoon.